So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Pippa, for inviting me. So um, I think everybody's going to say that, so you can just. Um, this is a uh, paper that I'm doing with uh, Charles Stewart at MIT. We're looking at um, voter attitudes toward election fraud across the US. This is, these are data from um, something called the Survey of the Performance of Election Administration um, that was, has, was done by um, the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project in 2008. And it's been replicated again in uh, 2012. And uh, it is a survey, I'll explain it in a minute, but basically where we asked 200 respondents in all 50 states questions about their, their voting experience. Um, and what I'm going to do today is to talk a little bit about um, people's views about election fraud. And so we asked people, um, the following is a list of activities that usually are against the law. Please indicate how often you think these um, activities occur, and you could answer um, <coughs> very common to it almost never occurs. So. So ballot tampering, this lady tampered with, she was a poll worker, tampered with ballots. Um, manipulating vote totals, so election officials manipulating things. These are people from Kentucky. Um, illegal absentee ballots, so people committing absentee ballot fraud. People voting twice, she's a Republican. <laughs> and uh, non-citizens voting. Um, and then finally, voter impersonation. So. Uh, I couldn't find somebody voting, like I didn't know how to do this, so I, was, I went with Superman. So um, as I mentioned, this is an internet survey, and we were asking questions about uh, the election experience. And one of the things that we're looking at in this is we're trying to think about what are the components of uh, a person and their experiences that lead them to um, have certain attitudes about election fraud. And we basically have a set of hypotheses about the fact that people with more experience voting are less likely to think fraud occurs. African Americans in the US context are more likely to be concerned about fraud. Non-voters should be more likely to be concerned about fraud. We also think about partisan characteristics. This gets to the work that Paul was just talking about, so I won't um, spend too much time on this. But basically, uh, voting for winners tends to help. Um, and Republicans are just a little fraud crazy, um, which we can talk about more later. Um, the, the point that I think builds upon what, what Paul was saying is that voters do, um, there's a lot of research that we've done using these data about voting experiences, and these are things that election officials can control. And so voters who have problems, so if they have to wait in line, if they have problems checking in, problems with their voting machine, problems parking, it's all part of the administration of an election, right? If your election official can't figure out how to make it where you can park, how are they gonna count your ballot if they can't do something that simple, like find a good polling place? Um, we look at the interaction that voters have with their poll workers. It turns out that the quality of the interaction you have with your poll worker is very important. Um, and we look at uh, the issue of photo ID, which is something that, that um, Stephen has studied quite a bit, um, and people's attitudes toward them. Finally, we think about state characteristics. So in the Supreme Court case that dealt with voter ID, basically there are these ideas that um, photo ID states should have, um, states with fo um, photo ID requirements before you vote should have uh, people there should have less concern about fraud. Um, we also have states where you have to have an excuse to get an absentee ballot, and we might think that those people would be less concerned about fraud happening in their community um, with absentee ballots because it's much harder <coughs> to get one as, as opposed to where Paul lives where they just like hand them out to everybody. And um, we also think about states with uh, election day registration. Those people are less likely to have problems voting, and that may carry through to their views about fraud. And then, of course, um, in America, where we have states with large Latino populations, we may think that people are very concerned about in-person fraud um, occurring. Um, and so I do this analysis in three different ways. I look at all respondents. Then I kick out the non-voters and just look at voters. And then I kick out absentee voters and just look at people who voted in person. So that way, I can look at their uh, experience with voting. And so these are the questions for, uh, you know, that fraud never happens. Um, as you see, people are most concerned about absentee ballot fraud occurring. Um, and they're not very concerned, oddly enough, with non-citizen voting, even though you would think that they would be, or voter impersonation. Uh, and for the things that fraud is, people think that fraud is common, it's, you know, basically lots of people think that non-citizens are voting. Um, if we look at the results, for all respondents. We find that people who are voters are less likely to think that fraud occurs, not surprisingly. Um, one of the key things here is that um, 
we do see that there are issues with um, African Americans. States with high Latino populations are more likely to think fraud occurs. If we look at voters, this builds on what Paul was just saying. Absentee voters have higher concerns about fraud, but then you can look at these questions with about the politics. If you're a Romney voter, uh, depending on the question, you're between eight and 26 percent percentage points more likely uh, than an Obama voter to think that fraud occurred. Uh, Democrats are less likely to think that fraud occurred compared to independents. So these, um, and re being a Republican didn't matter here because you're kind of absorbed into the Romney voter. And if you voted for a candidate in your in your county that lost the county total. So if you voted for Romney, but Obama won the county, you're, you're a local loser. And you're more likely to think that fraud occurred. And we do see an effect for EDR. People who live in EDR states are less likely to think that fraud occurs. Finally, if you look at in-person voters, and this gets to the point that Paul was bringing up, is if you're a, um, if you, are an election official and you can control the quality of the experience, you can have quite an effect on people's experience, on people's um, attitudes toward, um, toward fraud. Uh, people who don't have problems or who have an excellent poll worker are less likely to think that fraud occurs. People who showed ID are less likely to think that people vote twice, but they're not likely to think anything else. It doesn't affect any of the other questions. Um, and again, uh, voting for Romney or voting for, a, uh, or your candidate losing are very important. And so when we think about um, this in a broader sense, one of the things we can think about building upon what Paul was just saying is that for election officials, what they need to be able to do is to control the components that they can. They can't control the partisan attributes of what's going on, but what they can do is they can control the voting experience. And one of the things that we see here are, A, people's experience at the polls matter, and also the mode of voting matters. Absentee voters are just less confident and they're more likely to think fraud occurs. And it's not really clear why that's the case. And we also um, you know, see that fraud does seem to have some effect on people um, voting or not voting in the sense that um, people who are non-voters do tend to think that fraud is more likely. So these are things to be concerned about. Um, and they suggest that, you know, they can't control the politics, but they can control these other attributes of the process. You know, the other point that I would, I would make, though, about um, these loser effects is that it would be interesting to see if these loser effects are, are true cross-country and whether or not there are countries where, for instance, uh, people vote for losers and they don't necessarily worry about the outcome. So, for instance, you can imagine a multi-party system as opposed to uh, the U.S. system where you're either a winner or a loser, I can vote for a candidate that finishes third, but they will still be in the government, for instance. Or I might still have the representation in the parliament that, that fits with that. So I might vote for a loser who they don't finish first, but that I can still have this confidence. And this is an example um, where Pippa's point about cross-national comparisons is, you know, Paul's point notwithstanding that we do have 50 units here. Um, we do need variation across other things like the type of, of voting we see. So for instance, in the Estonian case, which I'm familiar with because I study internet voting, you know, we don't see the same sort of confidence problems among losers in general survey data that we're seeing here. And so that's an example of you know, where it may be the case that in a, parliament, in a parliamentary system with proportional representation, you don't have these same sorts of problems. So there.